video of last week's lecture in case there were any parts that you uh, maybe went too fast or uh, weren't clear enough you could see a second time. There, the link for that is on Blackboard or alternatively you can uh, go to YouTube and type in BCM Illustrator class. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so today we are going to cover really one topic, and that topic is image trace. It used to be called live trace, so if you hear me say the word slide trace, you'll just know that I'm outdated. Uh, and so image trace is a very powerful tool, and with great power comes great responsibility. And so some people will, who were in the United States in 2008 will remember this image here. This is from the Obama campaign, and uh, it's an iconic image. But it turned out that the person that made this may have done a little image tracing. And so uh, unfortunately, the Associated Press figured this out. Maybe not unfortunately, but uh, so maybe you'll notice the resemblance there. And so this is in a lawsuit against uh, the United States versus the, the artist that copied this image, Mr. Ferry. And uh, here's the actual image that it came from. So it wasn't, it wasn't like he took the entire image and then live traced it and got in trouble. He actually just took a little piece of it and then live traced it and got in a lot of trouble. So if you're going to live trace, you need to think about your legal right to do so. And so there are things in U.S. copyright law, I'm not a lawyer, so whatever I say here is not legal advice. Uh, in the U.S. at least, a derivative work is based upon one or more pre-existing works, such as a translation or a motion picture version, or some sort of reformed version of a previous work. And uh, just by changing it with editorial revisions, annotations, things like that, that doesn't change it into a so only the original copyright holder has the legal right to make derivative works. So there was actually a, a large court case in 1992, Rogers v. Coons, where you can see on the right there's a black and white picture taken by somebody in Germany, and then there's a, a, a statue, like a real 3D statue, that is sort of loosely based on that picture. And uh, the, the artist that made the statue made a lot of money. He sold them for like a million dollars each. And then the person that took the original picture that you see there in black and white sued the sculpture person and won in the, in the District Court of Appeals. And they had to not only pay hundreds of thousands of dollars of damages, but also had to ship the, uh, one of the remaining statues to Germany to the original copyright holder. And so the exception to using somebody else's copyright is called fair use. And there are four main criteria that allow you to uh, use something and claim fair use. That's the, the purpose and character of how you're using it. So things that favor fair use are educational, scholarship, research, news reporting, things like that, which is what we do, so that's good. All right, and so then the nature of the original work, kind of whether or not it's factual or if it's artistic. So if it's a factual thing, like a scientific you know, figure or something, that's factual, and so that favors fair use. Then the amount uh, of the, the original work that you used, if you use a little tiny corner, then that's not as bad as if you use the entire thing. And then the final part about fair use is how much your use violates the potential market for the original right holder. And so I see people yawning. Yeah, this is kind of boring, but at least you'll know these things when you are thinking about whether you can use somebody else's work. So there was a Supreme Court case just two years after the, the previous one about the statue, Campbell versus uh, a Cuff Rose music, no relation. Uh, and so the Supreme Court justices found that it's the, the important thing to think about in copyright law is to promote the useful arts and sciences and that creation of transformative works should be kind of protected as part of the fair, fair use. And so uh, if you made a really transformative work, then you're allowed to, get, to claim fair use. So overall, what I'm trying to tell you is there, you have two options if you're going to image trace something. Either have the rights because they are expressly given to you by 
how you found the image, or two, be ready to argue that you have a fair use right to use it. Right? So there's also kind of the ethical consideration too. Do you do you feel ethically like you can base your your figure on somebody else's work? And I think that's something that everybody has to ask themselves. Uh, and so the obvious easy way is to just find images for which you have the rights. And the Google image search actually has a tool built right into it to help you find images that you can use. And so we can like go to Google images right now. Say we want to find a neutrophil. And I can spell it right, honest. And so if you go over here to search tools, you'll see underneath the search tool there is usage rights. And you can click on the usage right, and then it has a whole bunch of different options for uh, what you want to search for. You can search for uh, reuse, reuse with modification, and uh, non-commercial reuse with modification. So if you're going to live trace, image trace something, then you're going to want to modify it, right? So you're going to want to select the, the reuse with modification. And so you look at these images and you think, oh, well, this one's not too bad. Maybe I'll build my neutrophil off of this one, right? And so you can search through the different things that you might have rights to and pick one that you have rights to. Or alternatively, you can turn off that filter and uh, try to argue fair use. Any questions? I am not a lawyer, but I will try to answer your question. Right, so uh, some specific licenses ask for attribu attribution, right? And so for those fair, like say a Flickr, for example, is a photo sharing website. A lot of people will put their, their photos up there for you to use, but they want attribution. And so you, in those cases, you should put down where it came from, uh, but you can't just put down, oh, I took it from here, now it's okay. So if they use their free to you, you can still use it as you like it, but you don't need it to your... It, depending upon the original li uh, license. So some of the things on Wikipedia, for example, are under just plain Creative Commons, no anything. You can do whatever you want with it. All right. So now that I've warned you about how not to uh, owe lots of money to people, let's actually learn about how to live trace. And so really the, the way that you, one live traces is, is five main steps. First is picking the image that you want to base your image trace off of. You can optionally pre-process the image to make it easier for the trace to work by using Photoshop. Then you're going to click the trace button and change the options in the, in the image trace window to get the look that you're looking for. Then you're going to expand the image trace results and edit them. And then finally, you're going to kind of clean up any stray marks that might be left over. So selecting the right image is really the key to image trace. And so you want to avoid images with backgrounds. Right? So it, if there's a background, then it's going to try to trace the background. But if there's only a white background, then it's easy. You just you know, delete it. Select images that have good contrast. If your image doesn't have good contrast, you could try to increase the contrast in Photoshop ahead of time, but maybe you don't have Photoshop. So if you are trying to make a mouse, then maybe use a brown mouse instead of a white mouse. And then uh, something that can be tricky is shadows, and you want to avoid harsh shadows. And so you can see on the difficult mouse here, there's this really dark shadow underneath them, which will make it difficult for the trace to be able to tell the shadow apart from the mouse. Whereas the one on the easy side has a much lighter shadow that will be easy to trace and then just delete. Alright, so image trace has a lot of modes and you can access the modes from the image trace panel. And they're labeled across the top of the panel. And so the two that we're going to really focus on today are uh, limited color and black and white. And so let's all open up, if you're following along, the image trace panel from window image trace there. And so you can see here, here's the image trace panel. If it doesn't look exactly like this, be sure to expand the advanced tab because we're going to be using the advanced settings here in just a moment. And you can see along the top, we have the different modes. And in my opinion, the most useful modes are the low color mode and the black and white mode. All right, so let's start off with the first uh, art bar here that says simple art. 
And here's that image of the neutrophil, which we just got off of Wikipedia, which we're fully entitled to use. And we'll click on it, and then we'll hit the low color button. And it will think for a while, and it will put out what you see on the screen there. Is everybody following along up until this point? Yes, window image trace. If you have a version of CS4 or earlier, there's not going to be an image trace panel. Instead, you click on the image, and then up in the top area here, there's going to be a button that says Live Trace. Yeah. All right, so uh, everybody's version of Illustrator is going to be slightly different how they handle it. And I have CS6. Hopefully, uh, some other people have CS6. But I think that uh, this, this image that we see right here is probably too, uh, too grainy to really be of any use, right? And so what we want to do is we want to make it simpler so that it doesn't look like we just live traced an image. And so what I found is one of the best things to do is just decrease the number of colors. So I'm going to decrease us to four colors instead of uh, 30 colors or whatever it was before. All right, and so, you know, that's looking a little better. Maybe we can get away with three colors, so I'm going to turn it down to three colors. I think that looks good. So you can see how the edges of the live trace are kind of jagged, and so what we want to do is we want to decrease the amount of detail that's being traced on there to kind of smooth out those edges. So there are two uh, controls underneath advanced that are going to decrease the complexity of the trace. That's the paths and the corners. And the paths are going to make the path smoother if you move it towards the low, and it's going to make it more jagged if you move it towards the high. So I'm going to move it higher, and you can see how it's going to get, well, it got a little bit more jagged. But if I move it down towards the low end, things are going to get much simpler. All right? And so the corners control how sharp the corners of the traces are. And if you decrease this more towards less, then the sharp corners which aren't really present anymore, are going to kind of be attenuated. And then the final thing that we have here is the noise. And the noise, if, if you move it uh, lower, it's going to find finer detail in the image. Whereas if you move it to the, t to the t more towards 100, it's going to try to get rid of the finer detail. And so you can see there, by increasing the noise to 100 pixels, a lot of the things inside the cell went away. And so now I have a really stylized, basic-looking So uh, I'll wait and give you guys a couple seconds just to do that on your own. And this, if anybody has any questions. OK. So now that we have our image trace, we're going to have, we, maybe we want to change the color. Maybe we're not happy with the color of the nucleus. And so to do that, we have to do two things. The first thing is we have to expand the live trace results. So on the second panel, I have a live trace result that I already made for you. And in order to be able to edit the individual components, we need to expand the appearance. So even if I use the direct select tool here, I can't, I can't click on anything. It's all stuck together. And so to get around that, I'm going to select it with the select tool. And then I'm going to go to object and expand. And so this is the first time we've really used expand. But what expand does in general is it converts an image, uh, an object of any type, and it makes it into editable kind of individual chunks. And so I've selected my live trace results, and I'm going to click expand from the object menu, and I'm going to allow both objects and fills. And so now you can see that the individual pieces of the live trace are now outlined in blue, which means that they are uh, accessible. And so if I use the direct select tool, now I can click on the individual components. Let me zoom in there a little bit. You can see that it, with the direct select tool A, I can click on the individual components. And I can even like move them around if I want to. All right. And so right now, though, if I use the regular select tool, all these pieces are stuck together. And the reason for that is because they are grouped. And so if you right click on the group and you click on ungroup, then you would think that it would ungroup them. But they're still grouped. And this is one of the, the mysteries of Illustrator. I don't understand why it does this, but it still persists to, 
to Creative Cloud as far as I know. You have to ungroup it twice. <laughs> and so now that I've ungrouped it twice, or maybe three times, yeah, now it is ungrouped. So all the pieces are moving around independently. And so I don't like the background, so I'm going to collect it and I'm going to delete it. And I don't know what this is, but I don't want it, and I'm going to delete it. All right, and so you can see that there are still a couple of little artifacts on top of the nucleus here that we don't really need. So I'm going to select both of those and delete it. And so our neutrophil is looking better already. But now maybe I want the nucleus to be a little bit more purple because I used a little too much of one stain instead of the other. And so I'm going to click on that individual component, and I'm going to on a different color. So you can see that each one of these things is now editable. You can change it with a pen tool or a smooth tool as we're going to learn later to kind of fit your exact wants and needs. All right, any questions about expanding and uh, ungrouping? What was the nature of the object before we expanded? It was a live, the question was what was the nature of the object before we expanded it? And as far as I know it is known as a an image trace object. So there are these special kinds of objects, like a, a live paint object. You'll remember we created one of those in the, the second uh, session. And in order to get those back into their individual components, we use expand from the object menu. Great question. Yes? So uh, Max, at least, will, the question was, can you expand objects from other programs? And so if it's, a, if it's a raster image, like we learned in the very first, where there are pixels as opposed to vectors, then you can't expand it. But if it came from PowerPoint, and you're like making your figure in PowerPoint with individual lines and boxes and whatnot, uh, those are transferred, at least in the Mac clipboard, as vectors. And if you paste those into Illustrator, you can usually move the individual elements around. All right, so let's move on to the next panel, which is abut versus overlap. So if we go back to our presentation here, we can work. At the bottom of the image trace, I've cut off the top here so it's easier to see. At the bottom, there's a little box that says method. And there are two little icons. And if you hover your mouse over the icons next to method, one will say abutting, and the other one will say overlapping. And so the difference between the abut and the overlap is that in abut mode, all of the pieces are being cut out from each other. And so this might be useful if you, uh, some strange day, want to cut out two different pieces of color and combine them into one. I don't usually ever use abut mode because it causes trouble when you try to smooth out parts of one color and it, it leaves white space between the two colors because they've been cut out from each other. So I almost never use abut mode. So overlap mode, what it does is it tries to make every color its entire, an entire object and they just cover each other. And so they're ordered in, in an order that overlap with each other. And that way you can just move one and it doesn't leave that white space behind. And of course, if you ever want to remove that white space, you can use the shape builder tool like we learned in a second and just subtract it with the shape builder tool. So as far as I'm concerned, there's no benefit at all to using a button mode. Always use overlap mode. All right, so let's just let's just see how that uh, works. Uh, on the third panel, we have the same live trace that has been created in in a butt mode, or on the one that says a butt, and then overlap mode on the one that says overlap. And you can see how the two different uh, work. So I think the take home message from that is just use overlap mode. And so as an example of how that's a problem. Say I want to, you know, smooth out my, smooth out my nucleus here. If I hit the smooth tool, you can see that it starts bringing the white space between the two colors, and that's really not what we want. But if I do that over in the overlap mode, it doesn't care because they're just overlapping images or overlapping objects. Any questions about the two modes? All right, great. 
So moving on to the fourth panel, fourth artboard, which is isolation mode. And so uh, during your time in class, you might have come across a group and accidentally double clicked it. And then you're like, I can't get back out. I can only, I can only access the things that I double clicked on. And that's because you've accidentally entered isolation mode. And so you can edit a group or something that has a clipping mask as if it's its own thing and just ignoring the rest of the entire artboard. And so that's useful if you want to say select something of the same color within a group but don't want to select it outside the group. And so I have live traced this brain for you on this panel and you'll see that they're still in a group. And so right now I can, I can currently click on anything in the entire the entire artboard. But then if I double click on the brain, now I've entered isolation mode. And you can tell because at the top it says here group. And so if you wanted to leave isolation mode, you can push this little arrow at the top. It may be difficult to see because it's getting cut off, but there's a little arrow and you click the arrow and you are exiting the isolation mode. The easier way uh, is you can just click outside of the group double click outside the group and it goes back to the artboard. So another way to enter isolation mode is to right click on the group that you want to isolate and choose isolate selected group. So now I'm working on this brain as if it's the only thing in the entire artboard and so when I select something on the brain it doesn't go and select other things outside the brain. So I think that this brain is looking a little bit too shiny. So I want to get rid of those really bright parts of the brain that are showing up there. So I'm going to click on one of the white spots in the brain. And then I'm going to go to Select Menu, and then Same, Fill and Stroke. And so what I'm doing here is I'm looking to select all the white objects in the brain so that I can change them into another color all at once, as opposed to having to click on the white one and change the color, click on the white, change the color. So I'm going to click on one of the objects that's white, and then I'm going to select Same Fill and Stroke. And so you'll see that it's selected all the white objects in, in this group. And it's not selecting any of the white objects on the rest of the file, only the ones in the isolation mode. And so now that I've got them selected, I'm going to switch to the eyedropper tool with I, and then I'm going to take this color right here that's less white, and now my brain looks slightly less shiny. And so this is especially handy when you have just made a live trace or an image trace and you are trying to edit it a little bit and you want to change one color to another, but you don't want to change all the other artwork that you've been working on for the last three days. You just want to change that one live trace that you just made. And so you, you can enter isolation mode and edit it. Any question about isolation mode? All right. So I'm double clicking outside of the group to exit isolation mode and moving on to the next panel, which is image trace and uh, complex art. So I've got this brain that is also Creative Commons license, so we can use it. Uh, and we want to kind of, you know, it looks nice and all, but let's make our own live trace version of it. And so we'll click on the object and you'll see there's a button up here at the top that says image trace. And then if you click on this little button up here, kind of like a control panel, it will open the image trace for you. That's another handy way to get to it. All right, and so I'm feeling like trying to make that same image that we saw in the previous panel. So I'm going to click on the low color mode. And it's going to think, and it's made a live trace version. And right now it's set on 16 colors. I think it's just a little too much detail. I want something that's a little bit more stylized. So I'm going to turn it down to, say, 5. That's not too bad. So I might try to play with the paths and the corners to get it just the way I like it. So I think that one of the good things about Image Trace is that it allows you to exert some small amount of artistic license on your work, right? It's not that you're just pushing the button and this is all that comes out. You kind of get to control how it looks uh, to your own kind of liking. All right, so that looks okay. Uh, 
I'm going to give everybody a chance to kind of play with it a little bit, and if anybody has any questions on how things are working. Yes? There is not, so you can undo in versions CS5 and higher, you can undo the live trace that you've just made. In CS4 and behind, it only ever makes the change that you make when you hit OK, and so there's no way to undo. But if I don't like that change that I just made, I can just hit Control-Z to undo, and it will go back to the previous way. Uh, and you can also click a button here. There's a little I on the, live, the image trace panel. If you click and hold, it will show you the original versus the, the live trace version. So you can, you can really see how they're different. All right. So we made a, a pretty nice brain, and we learned how to make it a little less shiny. Now let's move on to the mosquito. So I found this mosquito after like hours of looking for the perfect mosquito for this class. Uh, but it's got this nice white background. It's got a very faint shadow, good contrast. So when I hit the low color button, it looks okay. Let me turn. Uh -huh. So uh, I turned down the noise so it would find more detail in the legs of the, of the mosquito. And so this is kind of one of those things you just got to play around with the sliders until it looks like you want. And so if you're on a, if you, if it's not changing as you click, there's a little checkbox at the bottom of the live trace that says premium. So make sure that's checked so that it, when you move one of the sliders, it changes the artwork. So what I did was I decreased the noise all the way to 1, and I turned up the paths a little bit to 92. I think I'm going to decrease the number of colors down to get rid of that shadow. I think if I go low enough. Ha. And so there I have uh, what I think looks like a, a pretty decent looking mosquito with only a couple of clips on the live trace. Any questions about how that worked? This one, I wanted to get detail out of it, so I turned down the noise and turned up the paths. And like every other live trace I've done so far, I've tried to turn down the number of colors. Yes? Why is it not creating any strokes? So as since CS5 and higher, you can no longer create strokes in color mode. They took this ability away. In the black and white mode, uh, we'll see in just a minute, you can create strokes. But why they decided to make that go away is beyond me. And sometimes I find myself wanting to go back to CS4 just so I can have the strokes back. All right, so moving on to the second mode that we're going to learn about today for, live, for image trace, which is silhouette or black and white mode. And so sometimes you want the color rendition of what you're trying to trace, but other times you just want the outline so that you can use it as just a simple part of a figure. So say that we want an icon of a mouse. You know, this mouse, he looks pretty good. So why don't we image trace him and make kind of a silhouette? And so to do that, you can either click on the black and white mode icon there, or something that I think works better often is going to the presets and choosing silhouettes. And that'll automatically put in some uh, settings that will help out a little bit. All right, so you can see that the silhouette has taken effect there. And it, it looks, you know, okay. But I think we can change the settings a little bit to make things a little better. And so in color mode, we had a color slider here where it had more colors versus less colors. Whereas here we have a slider that says threshold. And in black and white, there's only two colors, right, black and white. And so the threshold sets the, the brightness value that changes from, from white to black. And so if we set it at less, only the darkest parts of the mouse are going to be filled in as black. Whereas if we move the slider to more, pretty much any color that's on the image 
is going to be converted to black. And so we can see how that works by clicking the, and holding the eye. We can see that the shadow, even though it's pretty faint, when we have the threshold set high, it gets converted to black. And so I'm going to turn it down just a little bit to try to get rid of the shadow. That's a little too much. No. That looks pretty good. So in black and white mode, the main thing that you're trying to do is set the threshold so that it looks like you want okay, to get rid of the background and keep the foreground. And if the paths are too uh, jagged, you can turn down the paths. I think it looks OK. And the corners aren't too sharp. I think it looks OK. Any questions about the black and white mode? So the next panel is going to talk about how to make the image trace. You know, you did your image trace, you moved those sliders around as much as you could, but it just doesn't look quite like you wanted. And so why don't we expand the trace that we just made and then edit it to be, you know, just perfect. And so what I've done is I've already traced one for you. And then I have given you kind of instructions on ways that I would want to make it a little bit cleaner. And so the first is there are kind of some bumps in the, the mouse's ear. Oops, that's a little too close. Right, and so we want to we want to flatten that out and uh, get rid of that bump in his ear. And so I've already expanded and ungrouped this twice, so this is ready to be edited. And if I click on the mouse, you can see that it's outlined in blue, and all the anchor points are appearing. And so we can now edit them. So go ahead and select the mouse. And now I'm going to switch to the pen tool. All right. And so I want to get rid of that, that first anchor point there that's causing that dip in his ear. And so you can see as I move the pen tool over the anchor point there in the dip, it switches to the minus sign. So pen tool, which the shortcut is P, with the mouse selected, if I move my pen tool over that anchor point in the ear, it's going to switch to a minus sign. And so if I click on the anchor point, it's going to go away because it's in minus mode. And so now you can see that the, uh, the ear is now much, much flatter. So I'm going to cheat and move it to the, for the front so that you can see what's going on. And so there's a lot of detail here on the mouse's head. And I don't think that we need that many anchor points. So I'm going to keep on using the pen tool. And I'm going to remove some anchor points until it's simpler. And you can just keep on removing anchor points that you think are extraneous. You can see that there are three here at the tip of the tail. We don't need three anchor points at the tip of the tail, so I'm going to remove two of them. Now he's got a pointing tail. I don't think I put any arrows anywhere else. All right, so uh, we've cleaned up the path quite a bit, and we've removed some of those kind of jagged edges that we created. And I think I'm going to get rid of that one, too. Much better. All right. So what, one thing you can see here is there's this white spot in the middle that was created because his ear was a little bit too bright, and I had the threshold set a little bit too uh, low. So the bright spot on the inside of his ear got changed into white. And I don't want that. So what I can do is I can use the direct select tool, which is A, the, the empty arrow. This is gonna, now I'm going to select the path that determines that white space. And so you, you see when I click on the path, it's highlighted. And I can, I can get ready to delete it. So I've clicked on that path that defines the white space. Now I hit the delete key. Oh, it's still there. That's OK. I can push it again, and it'll delete the rest. So when I clicked on the path, I selected one of, the, one of the little line segments in the path. And when I hit delete, I removed that line segment. But Illustrator knows what I want to do, so it's ready to delete the rest of them if I hit delete again. So I just click on the path and then hit delete twice. And that uh, deleted the white space. So that's good. So what, what I think uh, one of the problems here is that you can't really tell apart the mouse's you can see three of his, his legs, but the third one is kind of 
stuck in with the rest of his body. And so to get around that problem, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the mouse with the direct select or with the select tool, the, the dark arrow. Then I'm going to use the erase tool. So the erase tool is shift E. It should be uh, the first tool that is in this position. And so you can see that there is now a circle underneath the cursor. And this circle is going to delete the fill of the mouse whenever I click. So I could draw a line that will start deleting things inside the mouse, right? But that's, I want to try to create something a little realistic. So I'm going to take the, the eraser tool here, and I want to kind of make some space between his legs so it's not nulled in with the rest of the body. And you can change the size of the eraser tool by hitting the bigger bracket and the smaller bracket. So the, the left or the, sorry, the right bracket makes it bigger, and the left bracket makes it smaller. So I'm just going to draw in some space here. Be a little too much. I'm going to make it a little smaller. All right, it's looking a little, uh, a little too cut out there. So I've, I've cut out enough space to be between his body and his leg to make the leg visible, but now I've got kind of a jagged bad edge, and so I want to make it flow more naturally. So this will bring us to the last tool that we're going to use here, which is the smooth tool. The smooth tool automatically removes anchor points and smooths out curves. So the smooth tool doesn't have a keyboard shortcut, but you can find it underneath the pencil tool in this position right here. If I just click and hold down, I can find the smooth tool underneath it. So you have to select what you want to make smooth before you try to start smoothing it. So I've already selected the mouse. And now I'm just going to smooth out these anchor points by clicking and dragging across them. And so you see that it got rid of a lot of anchor points just with a single smooth, uh, smooth tool action. So I'm going to just finish up here on the end of this leg. And so I've created room for his leg. And again, I'm not an artist, so uh, that's not too bad for me. Any questions about editing a live trace object using the eraser and uh, smooth tool and pen tool? All right. So the next panel is Photoshop Assist. Sometimes trying to live trace something, just no matter how much you try, it doesn't work. And so a lot of you probably spent $400 on Creative Suite or however much it costs these days. So you have Photoshop. And if you have Photoshop, you might as well get the power of Photoshop to edit the photo first. And so to, for those of you that have Photoshop, let's, let's use Photoshop to help us live trace this embryo. So it's a selectable image. I'm just going to copy it to the clipboard. I'm going to start Photoshop. I actually have it already going. But you can start Photoshop. Photoshop. I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna start a new document. New. And it knows what's on the clipboard, so it's already set up the document, ready to accept what's on the clipboard. So I'm just gonna go along with whatever it says. I'm gonna paste the image in. It's gonna ask me what I want to paste it as. I'm gonna select pixels. All right. Now. It's about to put those pixels down on the page. It, it wants me, it's like, do you want to move it before I put these down? I'm okay with where it is, so I'm going to hit enter to put it down. So let's recap. Right now I have the image on my clipboard that I copied from Illustrator. I'm going to make a new document. It knows how many pixels already, so I'm going to hit OK. And I'm going to paste it as pixels. And I'm going to hit enter to put the pixels down. All right, so if you're following along, does anybody need a couple seconds to get their Photoshop going? All right, so now this is going to be so simple, it's going to blow your mind. I'm going to use the magic wand tool. The magic wand tool selects things of the same color within a given tolerance. So the magic wand tool's keyboard shortcut is W. 
and then there's a box at the top here that says tolerance. And this is going to be how far away from the color that I actually click on is the magic wand going to also select. So smaller numbers are going to mean really close to the same color, and bigger numbers are going to mean uh, colors that are very different than what I click. And so I'm going to unclick contigu contiguous because I want it to get rid of the black that's on the inside that is not continuous with the rest of the outside. So I've got the tolerance set at 20, and I have contiguous set to unchecked. Should I place? Yes, place. That's what the inner does. All right, so I've got my magic wand tool set, tolerance 20, contiguous set to off, and I'm going to just click in the black space. All right, piece of cake, right? Now I'm just going to hit delete, and that takes care of the black. All right, so you can see that the, mar the, the marching ants, they call them, the marquee shows where, what is selected. I'm going to need to make just a little tiny bit more changes to the embryo. So I'm going to deselect what I have selected right now with select, deselect. So now you can see the marching ants are no longer present on the, on the image. But you can see here there's kind of this stuff on the embryo's back. And there's also an umbilical cord, and I don't want either of those things. So I'm going to use the eraser tool. It works very similar to how we just saw it work in Illustrator, only it deletes pixels instead of deleting shapes. And so you can make the eraser tool bigger or smaller with the brackets, just like in Illustrator. And now I'm just going to start deleting that stuff. It's going to be tricky to get in between the foot and the body, so I'm going to make the eraser smaller, and I'm just going to erase the rest of it. And I'm going to make the stomach, the embryo, kind of smooth. All right, piece of cake, right? Just one magic wand, click, delete, and then erase some extraneous stuff from the embryo. You said that you set it where? The magic wand was set to tolerance 20 and contiguous unchecked. And then the uh, eraser is just set to the default 100% erasing pressure. All right, so now that I've got the embryo how I want it, I can just select all with edit select all, and then copy, and I'll take that back to Illustrator and paste it in. So I've already... Uh, made one for you if you don't have Photoshop so that you can see how much easier it is to live trace this with the pre-processed image. And so just to show you really quickly, if I set this to image trace and then do the flat silhouette like we did in the previous to make the mouse, it basically comes out automatically, just piece of cake. Whereas if I tried to do that on the original image, First off, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> it's, it's really, I've I tried this for a long time today. It's really not possible to get rid of this stuff here. And so instead of having to click and manage all those little paths in Illustrator, I can hit the magic wand tool and erase a couple of pixels and be ready to go. And so for some things like if some the background is not easy, like black, you can erase it manually. If it's grass, for example, you could erase the grass with the eraser, and that would make it much easier to live trace. Yes? What's wrong with using the Illustrator Magic Wand? I don't think I've actually ever used the Illustrator Magic Wand. So that would be one of the workflows that I'm not familiar with. Sorry. So that might be something to think about. Try to try out the magic wand tool, which you can see is right here underneath the select tool. All right, and so the final thing today is kind of not related to the image trace that the rest of the lecture has been about. It's about transparency and the appearance tab. And so transparency is something that can add depth to your uh, work, and it also makes life a lot easier. 
So what I have here is a Venn diagram. Everybody loves Venn diagrams, right? And so if I wanted to color these, Venn, I made this in R, just standard Venn diagram with the Venn package. If I wanted to make this a color, you know, I can select that and I'll use the eyedropper tool. I'll just take this blue color right here. All right, that's nice. Uh, now you, it doesn't look very good. Look, let's keep on putting the colors on here. You can follow along. Sorry. Uh, recall that I'm holding down shift when I click on the eyedropper to only take the fill color instead of the appearance. See a little bit of review. Alright, so I've taken those colors that are off to the side, and you can see that you can't tell the overlap of the Venn groups anymore. So one way around that would be to try to live paint each one individually. Or alternatively, what we can do is we can add a little bit of transparency. So there are two ways to add transparency in Illustrator. And those are the transparency panel, which is under window, transparency. And the transparency panel will apply transparency to the entire object, every part of it. So if I click hold down shift and select all of the circles and I use the transparency panel you can see right here let me tear it out of there see there's the transparency panel there's a number that says opacity and I'm going to set it to a lower value like 60 and so now you can you can see through those Venn diagram circles and you can see how the different groups overlap and so this is a useful thing to do transparency is actually super useful but one thing that you'll notice is that not only are the lines, or not only is the fill of the circle transparent, the line around the circle is also transparent. And maybe I don't want the, the line, the, the stroke, to be transparent. And you can actually control the transparency and really the appearance of every part of an object independently. So I'm going to undo that transparency change. And if I click on one of these, I'm going to, instead of using the transparency panel, I'm going to go to Window and choose Appearance Panel. So the Appearance Panel is a great way to manage the appearance of any object in Illustrator. And you can see when I have the Venn Diagram Circle selected, the Appearance Panel tells me every appearance attribute of that object. It's telling me that there's a stroke, and that it's a weight of 0.75, and it's color black. And it's at the default opacity. And then there's a fill, it's green as the default opacity, and the entire object is the default opacity, and that's by 100 by default. And so I can change the opacity of an individual part of this object independently. So I can click on the opacity underneath the fill, and then I can set it to a lower number, 660. And so now, if you look, the, the stroke is 100% opaque, and yet the fill, you can see through. All right, so I'm going to just do that to all of them real quick. To recap, I'm just clicking on the object using the appearance panel, clicking on the opacity underneath fill, clicking on it, and now I can edit the opacity, I can change it to a lower number. And so you can see that all of the strokes are 100% opaque and all the fills are transparent. All right, and then the final thing that I'm going to teach you about an Illustrator is applying special effects to objects with the Appearance Panel. And so let's go to the window and pull up the Appearance Panel like we had before. And we're going to click on this mouse. And he's supposed to be underwater. But yet he's like you can clearly see him. And if you were looking through glass and through water, he'd be kind of fuzzy. And so let's apply a special blur so that he looks a little more fuzzy under the water. And so with the mouse selected, somehow it's in the group. So ungroup it twice. It must have been live traced. Sorry about that, guys. So I've got my mouse, 
I've ungrouped him twice because he was a live trace image. And so now you can see in the appearance panel, I've got no stroke and I've got a black fill because the mouse was made black. So I'm going to click on the fill because I want to apply a special type of effect to him. And you'll see at the bottom here, there's an FX button. FX stands for effect. <laughs> and if I click on that FX button, you'll see there's a variety of different effects that I can apply. And so right now I'm interested in a Gaussian blur, Gaussian blur. And so it brings up the Gaussian blur panel, the window. I can click preview so I can see what it's gonna look like. And I'm gonna set it for four pixels to blur my little mouse. So now you can see that he's blurred and so it looks like he's actually underwater. So there's an entire like set of uh, special effects that you can put on an object and these, these effects are non-destructive. So if you were doing this in Photoshop and you applied a blur, those pixels are now forever blurred. Whereas in Illustrator, the, fill, or the, the blur effect can be turned on and off at any time. So there's a little eyeball next to Gaussian blur in the appearance panel. If I click the eyeball, the blur goes away. So maybe early on in my uh, figure creation, I decided I think this mouse would look good blurred. But then two years later, I'm like, you know, maybe it wouldn't look good blurred. So I just go back and I turn off the blur effect. And that's one of the great things about Illustrator is it's so non-destructive and you can always kind of go back and change things, especially if you use the uh, appearance. And so we can also do other effects that you probably are familiar with in PowerPoint, like, let me take him over here. So I've got my mouse. I can use other effects like drop shadow, which is, where is drop shadow? Sorry? Stylize, no, wrong stylize, ah, stylize drop shadow. So you can apply that to the fill and you can see the preview and now you've got a drop shadow behind your mouse. And if you don't like the drop shadow anymore, you can just turn it off by clicking the little eyeball. And you can see that the blur is actually still applied, I guess to the other one. There we go. The blur is still applied, so I can turn it on and off anytime I want. But if you're sure that you never want the blur again, you can take that effect, you can drag it right out of there and drop it over this trash can. And that will delete. All right, there are some other cool ones like uh, glows, inner glow. So I would uh, encourage you to look through the different uh, effects that you can put on. All right, and so one last little piece of uh, knowledge that I have been neglecting to tell you on purpose all this time is the lock and unlock. And so sometimes you have an object just where you want it and you don't want to change it anymore, but you still want it to be there so that the, the artwork is how it's supposed to be so you can add other pieces kind of in situ. And so you can click on any object in Illustrator and you can hit object lock. Object lock selection. And now I can't select it anymore. And so part of the reason I didn't tell you this is it just didn't seem like a good point to bring it up. But all these things that I've written down on the artboard to kind of help you along with what you're supposed to do are locked down. And you can unlock objects by going to object and unlock all. So now all the things in the artboard, including the things that I've put down there previously, are locked. And so this can be really powerful if you are trying to draw something on top of an image. You just lock down the image and then start tracing around it. All right. So with that, I think we are right on time. Does anybody have any last questions? All right. Thanks for coming, guys.